6.5 at Savati. Now on that occasion, the following evil speculative view had arisen in a certain Brahma. There is no ascetic or Brahmana who can come here. That having known with his own mind the reflection in that Brahma's mind, just as quickly as a strong man might extend his drawn-in arm or draw in his extended arm, the Blessed One disappeared from Jeta's grove and reappeared in that Brahma world. The Blessed One sat cross-legged in the air above that Brahma, having entered into meditation on the fire element. One moment here. So you see, eh? this Brahma, he had this uh, wrong view eh? that no human being, eh? no ascetic or holy man eh? can come to this heaven of his, eh? which is so far away from earth. Eh? He thought, eh? impossible for any humans, eh? even if they have psychic power, eh? to come to my heaven. Eh? Then the Brahma, uh, the Buddha happened to read his mind at that moment and flew to him uh, immediately uh, and sat uh, cross-legged uh, above this Brahma uh, meditating on the fire element. When he meditates on the fire element, uh, the body becomes like fire, uh, emitting fire. Then it occurred to the Venerable Maha Moglana, where now is the Blessed One dwelling at present? With the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human, the Venerable Maha Mughalana saw the Blessed One sitting cross-legged in the air above that Brahma, having entered into meditation on the fire element. Having seen this, just as quickly as a strong man might extend his drawn-in arm, or draw in his extended arm, the Venerable Maha Mughalana disappeared from Jeta's grove and reappeared in that Brahma world. Then the Venerable Maha Mughalana stationed himself in the eastern quarter and sat cross-legged in the air above that Brahma, though lower than the Blessed One, having entered into meditation on the fire element. Then it occurred to the Venerable Maha Kasapa, where now is the Blessed One dwelling at present? And with the divine eye, similarly, the Venerable Maha Kasapa saw the Blessed One sitting cross-legged in the air above that Brahma. Having seen this, the Venerable Maha Kasapa disappeared from Jeta's grove and reappeared in that Brahma world. Then the Venerable Maha Kasapa stationed himself in the southern quarter and sat cross-legged in the air above that Brahma, but lower than the Blessed One, having entered into meditation on the fire element. Then it occurred to the Venerable Maha Kapina, where now is the Blessed One dwelling at present? And with the divine eye, the Venerable Maha Kapina saw the Blessed One sitting cross-legged in the air above that Brahma. Having seen this, the Venerable Maha Kapina disappeared from this Jeta's grove and reappeared in that Brahma world. Then the Venerable Maha Kapina stationed himself in the western quarter and sat cross-legged in the air above that Brahma, though lower than the Blessed One, having entered into meditation on the fire element. Then it occurred to the Venerable Anuruddha, where now is the Blessed One dwelling at present? With the Divine Eye, the Venerable Anuruddha saw the Blessed One sitting cross-legged in the air above that Brahma. Having seen this, the Venerable Anuruddha disappeared from Jeta's grove and reappeared in the Brahma world. Then the Venerable Anuruddha stationed himself in the northern quarter and sat cross-legged in the air above that Brahma, though lower than the Blessed One, having entered into meditation on the fire element. Then the Venerable Maha Mughalana addressed that Brahma in verse. Today, friend, do you still hold that view, the view that you formerly held? Do you see the radiance surpassing that in the Brahma world? And this Brahma said, I no longer hold that view, dear sir, the view that I formerly held. Indeed, I see the radiance surpassing that in the Brahma world. Today, how could I maintain I am permanent and eternal? Then having stirred up a sense of urgency in that Brahma, just as quickly as a strong man might extend his drawn-in arm, or drawing in his extended arm, the Blessed One disappeared from that Brahma world and reappeared in Jeta's grove. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here you see, huh, the Buddha huh, has uh, many disciples huh, who have great psychic power, huh, probably almost equal to the Buddha's psychic power. That's why... Huh, Immediately they sense uh, that the Buddha uh, went to this uh, heaven uh, and uh, to show the support for the Buddha, uh, they also appeared in that heaven, uh, uh, sitting cross-legged like the Buddha, uh, but lower uh, and all emitting light. Uh. So here you see uh, the Buddha's disciples, uh, they are great masters of meditation. They can meditate on many objects, uh, so fire uh, is one of them. Uh, unlike nowadays, uh, people see uh, the Buddha's 
meditation is vipassana. The Buddha meditation is never vipassana. The Buddha meditation is all this, you see. Uh, meditation on the fire element and all his disciples uh, are skilled uh, in that. Uh. So, the, you must remember the Buddha uh, was in India. And in India, uh, the background, uh, all the Hindus, uh, they practice these kasina meditations. So, uh, at that time, uh, the Buddha was also considered uh, one of the many teachers, uh, one of the many Hindu teachers. Uh, uh, because the word Hindu uh, comes from the word Indus, Indus. In this valley, yeah, that uh, all the uh, India, like India itself, like, uh, so the Buddha's disciples uh, would have known all the common meditation subjects uh, during that time, uh, including all the kasinas. Like, uh. So when the Buddha and his disciples appeared in that world, uh, that Brahma was shocked like, because he thought uh, no human being can come here. And he also noticed uh, that their light, uh, the light they, the Buddha and his disciples emitted, uh, were much, much more brighter uh, than the Brahma uh, Devas. Uh. So uh, then he immediately uh, he changed his uh, view. Uh. He understood uh, that whatever the Buddha said uh, must be true uh, because the Buddha's psychic power is much, much more than the Brahma's. Uh. So, so he said, uh, now how can I say that, that I am permanent and eternal? Uh. Actually, they know, uh, these devas, uh, they know exactly what the Buddha is teaching. Because of their psychic power, they don't even have to come to earth. Uh, they can contemplate and they know the Buddha is teaching the Dhamma, saying that all the beings are impermanent, that all beings, uh, even their life is so long, uh, will die one day. But they refuse to believe. They refuse to believe. So now when the Buddha came uh, and uh, he saw the Buddha was not just a preacher, uh, just talk, uh, but no action. Now uh, he saw uh, the Buddha said, uh, was uh, superior to him in every way. Uh, then only he believed uh, that one day he has to die. Uh. Then the sutta continues. Uh. Then that Brahma addressed one member of his assembly thus, Come now, dear sir, approach the venerable Maha Moglana and say to him, Sir Moglana, are there any other disciples of the Blessed One that are as powerful and mighty as Masters Moglana, Kasapa, Kapina and Anuruddha? Yes, dear sir, that member of the Brahma Assemblies replied. Then he approached the Venerable Maha Moglana and asked him, Sir Moglana, are there any other disciples of the Blessed One that are as powerful and mighty as Masters Moglana, Kasapa, Apina and Anuruddha? Then the Venerable Maha Moglana addressed that member of Brahma's Assembly in verse. Many are the disciples of the Buddha who are Arahans with Asavas destroyed. Triple knowledge bearers with spiritual powers or psychic powers, uh, skilled in the cause of others' minds, that means can read others' minds. Uh. Then that member of Brahma's assembly, having delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Maha Moglana statement, approached that Brahma and told him, Dear Sir, Venerable Maha Moglana speaks thus, Many are the disciples of the Buddha who are Arahans with Asavas destroyed. Triple knowledge bearers with psychic powers, skilled in the minds of others, skilled in the others' minds, in the cause of others' minds. This is what that member of Brahma's assembly said, elated that Brahma delighted in his statement. So that's the end of the sutta. So here you see, yeah, Maha Moggallana told him uh, there are many, many of the Buddha's disciples uh, with such great psychic power. Uh, in some other suttas, uh, it is mentioned, uh, it's not just 100 or 200 and 300, uh, it's a few thousand during the Buddha's time. Now we come to the next sutta, uh, 6.9, at Savati. Now on that occasion, the monk, Kokalika, was sick, afflicted, gravely ill. Stop here for a moment. This monk, Kokalika, uh, was a supporter of this monk, Devadatta. Devadatta was a disciple of the Buddha who broke away from the Buddha and formed his own Sangha. So there were a few monks uh, who supported him. Uh, this Kokalika was one of his main supporters. So this Kokalika was sick. Uh. Then when the night had advanced, the, here he says the independent Brahma Tudu. Actually the word is Pachika, the Pachika Brahma Tudu. Pachika, maybe a better translation is solitary. Solitary Brahma, because most of the time they live alone. The heaven is so high, uh, uh, not many uh, are reborn in that heaven. So, because they are, uh, also because they are unisex, uh, they don't need a partner, uh, they live alone. 
uh, they find happiness uh, within themselves. Uh, their minds uh, is full of bliss. Uh, so they are called Pachika, Brahmas, uh, solitary uh, Brahmas. But here they translate as independent. Independent Brahma to do of stunning beauty, illuminating the entire Jeta's growth, approached the monk Kokalika. Having approached, he stood in the air and said to the monk Kokalika, Place confidence in Sariputta and Mogalana, Kokalika. Sariputta and Mogalana are well behaved. Stop here for a moment. Why does he come and tell this monk Kokalika to have trust, to have confidence in Sariputta and Mogalana? Because uh, this Kokalika uh, was a follower of Devadatta. And when Devadatta broke away from the Buddha, then uh, uh, this Sariputta and Mogalana went around uh, telling people uh, this uh, Devadatta is no more a disciple of the Buddha. Whatever he says uh, has nothing to do with the Buddha. Uh, he does not belong to the Buddha's uh, Sangha and all that. So in, in, in effect, uh, they were talking bad about uh, this Sariputta and Mogulana was talking back about Devadatta and his scam. So this uh, Devadatta and his followers uh, had a lot of hatred towards Sariputta and Mogulana. So this Kokalika was one of those uh, who had a lot of hatred uh, and talked back about Sariputta and Mogulana. So this Brahma came to warn him. Uh, why did the Brahma bother to come and warn him? Maybe they were friends before. <laughs> Former friendship, uh. Uh, come to warn him. And Kokalika asked him, Who are you, friend? And he said, I am the Pachika Brahma Tudu. And then uh, Kokalika said, Didn't the Blessed One declare you to be a non-returner, an Agamina? Then why have you come back here? See how far you have transgressed. So he stopped for a moment. Uh. So here this uh, Kokalika is saying, uh, the Buddha said you are a non-returner, they won't come back to the human world. Why you come back now to the human world? He's saying, uh, he's trying to tell him, uh, you, you say uh, I'm at fault, uh, criticizing Sariputta and Mughlana. You have uh, more fault uh, than me. Uh, you are supposed to be in that heaven and you come back to the human world. Something like that. Then the Brahma Tudu said, when a person has taken birth, an axe is born inside his mouth with which the fool cuts himself, uttering defamatory speech. He who praises one deserving blame, or blames one deserving praise, casts with his mouth an unlucky throw by which he finds no happiness. Trifling is the unlucky throw that brings the loss of wealth at dice, the loss of all, oneself included. Worse by far, this unlucky throw of harboring hatred against the fortunate ones. For a hundred thousand Nira Buddhas and thirty-six more and five Abuddhas, the maligner of noble ones goes to hell, having said evil speech and mind against them. Ah, that's the end of the sutta. So here the Brahma told him, every one of us is born with an axe in our mouth. We simply wag our tongue, say the wrong things, and we will cut ourselves. And here also, warning him uh, that if he has hatred uh, against uh, Arahans uh, like Sariputta and Mughalana, uh, he will go to hell uh, for an extremely long time. Uh. Here it talks about Nira Buddha and Abuddha and all that. Uh. So this this why I mentioned this sutta is because of this uh, verse. Uh, when a person has taken birth, an axe is born inside his mouth with which the fool cuts himself uttering defamatory speech. That means defames others, la, talk bad about others. La. Uh, because sometimes uh, a person doesn't realize uh, when you talk bad about somebody, uh, the word goes around and spreads. Uh, one person goes to ten, uh, ten goes to a hundred, hundred goes to a thousand. Uh, very soon, uh, uh, somebody uh, may have a bad reputation uh, because of your action. Uh, the next sutta, 6.10 at Savati. Then the monk Kokalika approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said, Venerable Sir, Sariputta and Mogalana have evil wishes. They have come under the control of evil wishes. When this was said, the Blessed One said to the monk Kokalika, Do not speak thus, Kokalika. Do not speak thus, Kokalika. Place confidence in Sariputta and Mogalana, Kokalika. 
Sariputta and Mughalana are well behaved. The second time, the monk Kokalika said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, although the Blessed One has my faith and trust, all the same, I say that Sariputta and Mughalana have evil wishes. They have come under the control of evil wishes. And the second time, the Blessed One said to the monk Kokalika, Do not speak thus, Kokalika, etc. Sariputta and Mughalana are well behaved. Third time, the monk Kokalika said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, although the Blessed One has my faith and trust, all the same, I say that Sariputta and Mughalana have evil wishes. They have come under the control of evil wishes. And the third time, the Blessed One said to the monk Kokalika, Do not speak thus, Kokalika. Do not speak thus, Kokalika. Please confidence in Sariputta and Mughalana, Kokalika. Sariputta and Mughalana are well behaved. Then the monk Kokalika rose from his seat, paid homage to the Blessed One and departed, keeping him on his right. Not long after the monk Kokalika had left, his entire body became covered with boils the size of mustard seeds. These then grew to the size of monk seeds, then to the size of chickpeas, then to the size of jujube stones, then to the size of jujube fruits, then to the size of myrobalans, then to the size of unripe beluva fruits, then to the size of ripe beluva fruits. When they had grown to the size of ripe beluva fruits, they burst open, exuding pus and blood. Then on, on account of that illness, the monk Kokalika died. And because he had harbored animosity towards Sariputta and Mughalana, after his death, he was reborn in the Paduma hell. Then when the night had advanced, Brahma Sahampati, of stunning beauty, illuminating the entire Jeta's grove, approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, stood to one side, and said to him, Venerable Sir, the monk Kokalika has died, and because he harbored animosity towards Sariputta and Mughalana, after his death, he has been reborn in the Paduma hell. This is what Brahma Sahampati said. Having said this, he paid homage to the Blessed One, and keeping him on his right, he disappeared right there. Then when the night had passed, the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, last night, when the night had advanced, Braha, Brahma Sahampati approached me and said to me, Rebel Sir, the monk Kokalika has died, and because he harbored animosity towards Sariputta and Mughalana, after his death, he has been reborn in the Paduma hell. Having said this, he paid homage to, him, to me, and keeping me on his right, he disappeared right there. When this was said, a certain monk said to the Blessed One, Rebel Sir, how long is the lifespan in the Paduma hell? And the Buddha said, The lifespan in the Paduma hell is long, monk. It is not easy to count it and say it is so many years, or so many hundreds of years, or so many thousands of years, or so many hundreds of thousands of years. And the monk said, Then is it possible to give a simile, venerable sir? And the Buddha said, It is possible, monk. Suppose, monk, there was a Kosalan cartload of twenty measures of sesame seed, at the end of every hundred years, a man would remove one seed from there. That Kosalan cartload of twenty measures of sesame seed might by this effort be depleted and eliminated more than a single Abuddha hell would go by. Twenty Abuddha hells are the equivalent of one Nira Buddha hell. Twenty Nira Buddha hells are the equivalent of one Ababa hell. Twenty Ababa hells are the equivalent of one Atata hell. Twenty Atata hells are the equivalent of one Ahaha hell. Twenty Ahaha hells are the equivalent of one Kumuda hell. Twenty Kumuda hells are the equivalent of one Sogandika hell. Twenty Sogandika hells are the equivalent of one Upala hell. Twenty Upala hells are the equivalent of one Pundarika hell and twenty Pundarika hells are the equivalent of one Paduma hell. Now monk, the monk Kokalika has been reborn in the Paduma hell because he harbored animosity towards Sariputta and Mughalana. This is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the Fortunate One, the teacher said this, When a person has taken birth, an axe is born inside his mouth, with which the fool cuts himself uttering defamatory speech. 
he who praises one deserving blame or blames one deserving praise cast with his mouth an unlucky throw by which he finds no happiness trifling is the unlucky throw that brings the loss of wealth and dies the loss of all including oneself worse by far the unlucky throw of harboring hatred towards the fortunate ones for 100000 nira buddhas and 36 more and five abudas the maligner of noble ones goes to hell having set the evil speech and mind against them yeah that's the end of the sutta so here you see yeah, because of hatred towards sariputta and moglana this monk kokalika has gone to this deep hell na yeah, where he will be there for so long time na yeah. uh, which reminds us uh, that uh, nowadays uh, if you look into some of the mahayana sut- sutras uh, they also try to put down the arahant sariputta and so you can imagine that uh, people who harbor hatred like that uh, against sariputta they will also have to reap their uh, karma vipaka so i stop here anything to discuss Mm, yeah. No, no. Which chapter was this? Which chapter? Uh, what page? Hmm? And number nine page. Ah, Brahma to do. Hmm. I don't know why. Four, zero, three. Mm, something wrong here because uh, non-return uh, is uh, anagamin and uh, anagamin is either born in the fourth jhana heavens, uh, the sudavasa, or is reborn in the formless realm, la. arupa in the realms. La. So. But if he's uh, like one returner, then he can he can be reborn in the Brahma heaven. So I can explain why there's a discrepancy here. That's why. Right? You know, dwelling alone uh, is uh, very much advised by the Buddha for his monks uh, because it is very helpful uh, to going into our mind. When we want to attain uh, liberation, uh, we want to get out of this world uh, of the six senses, uh, and to get out of the world of six senses uh, we have to go into deep meditation so if we dwell with others uh, it's difficult uh, because sometimes people want to talk to us even though we don't want to talk to others uh, and if we uh, dwell with others uh, there are so many things going on uh, that is this that can distract us uh. so sometimes uh, if a monk is serious about practicing uh, Uh, then now uh, even though he dwells with others for example in a monastery uh, then he spends a lot of his time uh, alone uh, either in the kuti without seeing others or he goes uh, to a quiet place uh, uh, to practice his meditation later on you uh, in the suttas uh, there is mention now uh, i think verbal ananda's preceptor verbal nikroda kappa i think 
he is one of the monks uh, he will go on armstrong meditation uh, sorry on armstrong uh, after he gets his food uh, he comes back he eats his food after eating his food uh, he will go straight to his kutti and lock himself in the kutti the whole day he only come out in the evening when there's a dhamma discussion uh, or the next morning uh, when he goes on arms round again so this person uh, so even though he dwells with others uh, he's practically dwelling alone uh, because he doesn't want to associate with others he practices aloofness uh, this is kaya viveka kaya viveka uh, dwelling alone uh, is helpful uh, for us to attain citta viveka citta viveka is a mental seclusion a mental seclusion that means secluding ourselves uh, from the six senses uh, the world of the six senses uh, and going back into our mind because that is the direction we have to go uh, if we want liberation if we want liberation we have to go away from the world of the six senses uh, and that that can only be achieved uh, by going into our mind so this dwelling alone uh, is uh, much advised by the buddha for the monks who are serious uh, who want to attain liberation i have uh, practiced dwelling alone for many years uh, and i find uh, it's very suitable for meditation when there's nobody to talk to you and you have no duties and nothing to do except to meditate and to read the the, the suttas uh, and because uh, you don't uh, have a lot of uh, what you call fun no uh, a lot of uh, things to disturb our mind uh, then uh, your meditation can come together very much uh, easier and when you dwell with people Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. She. Yeah. No. How would she be able to see the Brahma? Eh? No. When the deva wants you to see, yeah, then you can see. But on the other hand, if you have psychic power like the arahants, yeah, even though the deva don't want you to see, you can see them. Uh, but in this case, they want you to see. That's why they appear. That's why, like sometimes, ghosts want to disturb you. Huh? They will appear, make you see, lah, uh, and they make you see what what they want you to see, like frightening shapes and all that. Mm. So, like in one of the sutta, the um, Majima Nikaya, this uh, Mara came to disturb or uh, Mahamoglana. He just finished his meal and he was doing walking meditation, and Mara went into his stomach. Then he felt his stomach very heavy. Then he sat down in meditation, and very quickly, ah, uh, he saw Mara. They asked Mara, "Get out! Why are you disturbing?" And Mara came out of his uh, stomach, ah, uh, and then stood at the door, ah, uh, with his hand leaning against the door, and tried to use his psychic power, ah, uh, to make himself invisible. Uh. But because Mahamoglana's psychic power was greater, ah, uh, then Mahamoglana could see him. And told him, "You are standing at the door, and you think I can't see you, but I can see you." <laughs> so it depends on whose psychic power is stronger. The other thing. It is true that as we grow older, our body becomes weaker. But then we have to use our wisdom how to combat it. One thing, as we grow older, we don't physically exercise so much. 
So because we don't physically exercise so much, yeah, we can conserve some of our energy. And also because of that, yeah, we don't need to sleep so much. Yeah. Somebody who's young, yeah, who's very active, yeah, they need to sleep 8, 9 hours a day. You see. Uh, many old people, uh, they find uh, about two or three hours of sleep uh, is enough. Uh, but then if we are not used to it, uh, uh, we still feel quite tired. Uh. So uh, one way is to sleep less and put our mind uh, on uh, practice sati more, uh, put our mind on our meditation object uh, as often as we can. Uh. Sometimes, for example, if we are tired, uh, we lay down. We lay down but try not to sleep uh. Because uh, I think there is scientific evidence uh, that if we sleep about two and a half hours every day, uh, it is enough for the mind. Uh. But the body is something else. Uh, the body. So if we uh, don't exhaust ourselves, uh, by we as we grow older, uh, we find we have to lie down more. You know, uh, more often we have to lie down. You see, even in the in the suttas and the Vinaya books, uh, the Buddha sometimes talk with his disciples and he says. Uh, I have to lie down. My back is giving me pain. And then he asked one disciple to talk to the monks, to the Sangha, and then he will lie down. But he lie down, he, he knows exactly what they are talking. He doesn't fall asleep. Eh? Uh, so, well, that's the way. Nah, we, it's true, we have to lie down more. Eh? But then, uh, we try to maintain this uh, um, awareness. Lah. That's why this Jagariya, no yoga, is uh, uh, striving to uh, to keep uh, wakeful. Uh, in fact, in the Vinaya books, uh, we find that the Buddha expected his monks uh, not to fall asleep. Uh, we only ask them to lie down, for example, at night. Uh, they should lie down four hours. When we lie down, actually, uh, the body gets rested, you know. Uh, so, if we can maintain our meditation uh, object, uh, then uh, the, the mind is not so scattered. Uh, so the, you can maintain your concentration. Uh, That's very helpful. Uh, because uh, when our mind is very concentrated, uh, we don't need to sleep so much. Uh. Just as an example, uh, at, at, there was a time when my meditation was quite good. When I go to sleep, uh, one hour automatically uh, I get up. Uh. Uh, and after one hour, you feel quite refreshed. Lah. You don't feel. Uh, whereas if your mind is not concentrated, uh, you find you need to sleep a lot. Lah. So it's important to maintain our concentration lah, as much as we can. But if we are meditating, uh, we should uh, not allow ourselves to not we will always maintain a very straight posture. But if you find yourself nodding, it could be that you are exhausted, uh, physically exhausted. Then one way is to put your head down, put our head down, because when there is a chakra point here, when we when we put our head down, uh, we we get some rest. Uh. So if you do that and you still find you are very uh, tired, uh, and it's best to go and lie down uh, even for 5 minutes or 10 minutes. Uh. Okay, I think we have enough tonight. Uh. Uh,